let's talk about hummingbirds because aren't they just adorable and amazing? Um, the uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of, of Roseanne who lives in uh, a, a place that is sort of on the, uh, the hummingbird migratory freeway. Um, and uh, if you happen to be in a place that is, um, uh, that, that is in such a place, there are times where you are just swarming with hummingbirds. Um, the, uh, but even if you're not, if you, <laughs> if you feed them, they will come if you are up here in North America. And it's, uh, so I now, um, on my daughter's prompting, um, we uh, now have, we're, we're, we're growing our hummingbird feeding farm here. And uh, something that's kind of interesting about the way they behave is hummingbirds make these incredibly interesting calculations in their head about the value of different resources. And so what you have to, to, to balance is, if there's a food resource here, how many calories are you going to expend protecting it, right? Because protecting your food, that takes, that takes energy. Um, so if there's a limited resource, it's actually in the hummingbird's best interest to like, like this is mine, you know, y'all just don't even think of coming near my hummingbird feeder. But if there's a, there's a tipping point where when food is really abundant, they're like, you know, I have no fear of this food source tapping out. And, you know, come one, come all. And you can have your normally, you know, if you have like a hummingbird feeder, you will see a hummingbird. And that hummingbird will defend your feeder. And, <laughs> and, um, you'll get really good looks at that hummingbird when it feels like eating. And the rest of the time, we'll be chasing everybody away from your hummingbird. But if you have lots of hummingbird feeders, then it, it becomes a hummingbird party. And so uh, you can actually have multiple feeders all just sort of lined up, even within eyesight of each other. Um, if you have a medium amount of feeders, it's good to have one here and then one in another spot where the other one can't see. There's not a direct line of sight. But if you have enough feeders, you just line up all your feeders and everybody's like, like hey, it's a big old smorgasbord board here. And, and everybody's just sort of sidling up to the bar. And um, you can have, you'll have multiple hummingbirds all on, on each feeder. And so they're, they're just, they're so much fun to watch. So much fun to watch and absolutely beautiful. Totally fun to draw. And uh, so I've got one a, a meter away from me. So I can be sitting here at my desk and sort of the hummingbirds will come to it and like they'll do their hummingbird thing. So I can have, they'd be sitting at my desk. And so when, whenever one of those shows up, it's a little kind of bell of hummingbird mindfulness that says, and now it would be time to sketch a hummingbird. And so I try to give myself permission when the hummingbird shows up to, now it's, it's a hummingbird break and life gets better. So I wanna show you some tricks to help you get your hummingbird sketch on. And in doing that, we're also going to be talking about adding color um, on top of our hummers and making them look iridescent. First, I'm going to do a little bit of a share. And, and actually, what I can do is, yeah, well, well first, well, let's go into this. Here we are. Close this. And uh, what I wanted to do is to, to show you folks some sketches um, that I made uh, in Ecuador of hummingbirds. Uh, there was, it was kind of hummingbird palooza there. Um, in Ecuador, there's an incredible radiation of, of hummingbirds. And all of these birds, because they had a bunch of feeders set up, I was sitting in a place that all these birds are coming to the, the feeders. And I could just sit there and just bounce around. When, when this one would leave, I'd start drawing this one and this one and this one. But often there'd be multiple of these birds all on the feeders at the same time. And 
that was was really fun. So doing this, it helped me just be able to put in a bunch of hummingbird reps. And, there they are. Look at that crazy tail. Oh man, these little hummingbirds are amazing, amazing little critters. So the more that you get comfortable with the, the, the shape of the hummingbird, um, its body from the front, its head from the front, its body from the side, its head from the side, um, you are going to be able to then you sort of put those together. So you know, like here's here's back view with side view of the head. You can you you can turn parts of the birds around. So we're going to be thinking about the bird's head and the bodies in these different views, so that in your sketchbook you can you can draw those. I think there's a little bit more hummingbird love later on, um, and. Uh, We'll, we'll kind of get into what can you do to make them look just a little bit iridescent. And the trick, interestingly enough, is not going to be iridescent paint. Here are some more hummingbirds and hummingbirds. Just so much fun. Um, and let's see, here is. <clears throat> Here's just a little cartoon of me sketching a toucan while Carolyn behind me is hand feeding hummingbirds. <laughs> um, a few final hummingbirds, and I'll save the last hummingbird story for. Um, oh, actually, no. Here's more hummingbirds. All right. So I mean, just this is kind of interesting. To note, note just sort of the these these drawings. Here I look at these, and they kind of they feel like they have just a sense of hummingbird gestalt, kind of quickly getting the shape of the hummingbird. It's interesting to look at some of the early hummingbirds, and you know it's just it's a lot more more tentative, kind of trying to figure out my way around the margins of that bird, um, but. Um, you know, you know, trying to, you know, what's going on here with this? But after drawing them for a few days and having them really close, the hummingbird pictures were really starting to uh, just to, to 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 lock in. So let's take a look at how to how to do that ourselves. Um, I am going to hide. Loading meeting controls. All right, there is a little hummingbird, uh, an amazing, amazing little bird. Um, well, by the way, all the photographs that you're going to be seeing come from birdpixel.com. Um, and uh, what you can do is um, you go to that website and just type a hummingbird into the search bar and a lot of hummingbird images will pop up for you for your for your reference. Um, let's just take a look at the general body form. So this is a little bit far away from us, so we can just sort of see some body form. We're going to kind of notice a few little structural things about it. Um, what I do when I'm drawing a uh, Hummer, like I'm when I'm drawing everything else, I often start with just what is the shape of the air behind that hummingbird's back. I'm going to switch pencils. This one is nice and dark. There we go. So we've got a little bit of a curve of the head. The back comes out. There's a turn in the back and down. So that's my 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 starter line for getting my hummingbird going on. Um, I'm then going to put a little placeholder in for a head, and I'm going to notice which way it is holding its beak. This one is kind of looking up at an angle. Then the negative shape in front of this bird, in this case, it's sort of dropping down. There's not an angle into the throat and then to the breast. It's kind of coming down like that. And then that between this line here and this line here gives me a place to sort of put in 
the ball of the hummingbird's body. So I used to do the, these two circles first and then wrap these. Now what I do is I start with the shape on the back, block in a little head, get that shape in the front, and then put a little hummingbird body in there. Off the back of that hummingbird body, there's a little cone. There's a little cone of undertail coverts. And um, on a hummingbird with a short tail, that will be kind of the end of things. On this, um, uh, this, this, this sylph, um, it has just a massive, massive iridescent tail. For blocking in the wing, notice where the front edge of the wing starts in this bird, in the, somewhere up in here. And it's going to kind of arch out like that. So I'm going to have a wing that is going to be roughly in that area of my bird. Little hummingbird tummy. We can put in our stick. And notice that I'm not really drawing the feet. I see a little bit of a back toe sticking down here. And there's another one here. So um, hummers are, are in this group uh, called the apodiformes, which translates to the birds that don't have feet. So apode without feet. Um, they just have such tiny little feet. Um, that uh, that's um, that is uh, you're not going to be drawing big bird feet on these. So if you don't like drawing bird feet, hummingbirds are the species for you. One final angle that I find really useful is the angle that goes from the bill up onto the forehead. Is it a steep? Is it rounded? Is it a slope? Um, so look at this angle right in here, and that will often help you be able to, oh, hummingbird arrived at the feeder. It's on the other side of the feeder, so I can't really get a good look at it. But if they show up, I'll just start up. I'll have to kind of jump over into my, my obligatory hummingbird break. All right. So there's a little hummingbird shape. And um, what I'm going to do now is take a look at what about some of the details on the body of a hummingbird. That's a basic side view shape. So here we get um, a, a copper back and we are seeing this. We're seeing this beautiful little nugget. Um, and I am going to see if this tablet will, oh, we have to turn on the power button, that helps. And it's not getting a signal. Oh, come on. Well, I don't need to draw on the screen. Um, so here's, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, if you can see my little arrow, on the back of this bird. Um, that is, um, I'm going to be using that as a little pointer to help kind of guide our way around. I'm going to point out a few details on here and then I'm going to be drawing it on here. So let's first take the bill and eye. And notice that if you come back on the bill straight back, it goes right under the eye. That's going to help that, that, that bill line projected back helps you place your eye. Notice also this little kind of triangle of feathers or a little kind of triangle right in here. There's sort of a steep line here going right over this hummingbird's eye, and it kind of gives it an angry bird's look. Hummingbirds aren't don't feel like, gosh, oh, they feel like they they kind of got an intensity to it. And one reason is this sort of this, this, this slope in front of their eye. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give our hummingbird a little bit of a beak here. And on different species, you'll find different lengths, different shaped beaks. And that comes into the head. You come back on that line. And that's where you're going to have your eye. And see how this looks kind of like, golly, 
just sort of naive. And that one over in the photograph, it looks intense. That's because we need this triangle in the front of the eye here. And then it starts to look a little bit more like, ah, I'm a hummingbird, right? There's this wonderful, just kind of hummingbird intensity. Um, if I map the feathers of the head onto this, uh, which is, is going to be fairly subtle. There, bird, hummingbirds have a little ear patch. There is a little malar zone that comes back. And then there's a big throat zone. So you can think of the side of the head as ear patch, malar, throat. Um, on the top of the head, there are rows of feathers that reinforce this um, kind of angry birds look. So those feathers kind of come up in rows. Similarly, the feathers here come down in rows. If you are drawing scales, let's draw just sort of the, I'm going to give myself just a little Hummer head over here for just a moment. And I'll show you a don't do this. Give this a little triangle, a little bit of Hummer intensity. Um, so on the throat, it is made out of all these little scales. And you'll see in some of these um, feathers of uh, birds, especially when the uh, light is catching it right the right way, you can see some really cool throat feathers in here. The zone in here that's called the gorget. The gorget is the, the, the official name for kind of cool hummingbird throat. But here's what not to do. I'm not going to draw scale, 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 scale. See what I just did is fairly intuitive what I think I probably should be doing if it's just scales all the way across there. But what it's going to happen is this row of scales will be pointing towards me, but these ones in here are actually going to be pointing out in this direction. So you're not going to be seeing them in side view. So instead of thinking of it as scale, 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 think of it as if you are going to be drawing in the scales and you don't always have to, again, you look at most of the hummingbirds that I'm sketching here in these sort of fast drawings. Um, where is the hummingbird page? All right? You know, uh, a lot of places I'm not, I'm kind of leaving out a bunch of that detail. Uh, more hummingbirds. So you don't have to draw it in, but I'm saying if you are going to be doing that, you can think of these first ones as kind of scaling down towards you. But in here, um, the, sc the scales are going to be pointing out in this direction. So um, the so your your ability to kind of see those scale rows as kind of clear separate things gets less as you come to the front of the throat. Might have a little hint of it here, but as you get closer to this edge, we're not going to do that. So we're not going to draw scales all the way across that space. Let's take a look at the wing of the Hummer for a second, because this is really cool. Watch, I need to step across the room here for just a moment, pulling a book off my shelf. Uh, 
the wing shapes of hummingbirds, when you really get into hummingbird, uh, when you really start geeking out on hummingbirds hard, um, there are subtle differences in the wing shapes of some hummingbirds. Um, and so if you have, this is David Sibley's second edition of his bird book. And if you know me, I'm a, I, I just think David Sibley is the, the bomb. I love this guy. Um, but check this out on one of his, um, in the start of his, his hummingbird section, he has a little diagramming showing that the shape of the wings is really different on some different hummingbirds. Um, so for instance, the Annas and Costas have just sort of this even row coming down. Black chin, you're gonna come down and curve, right? Um, narrower here in, 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 uh, in, in, in ruby throated. And then the broad tailed, um, if the wing is spread a little bit, the, 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 these final ones have, have kind of narrow, very skinny tips on them. Um, if these are folded up more, you won't be able to see those, but it will go to more of a sharp point. So what we can do is just sort of take that as a lesson that you can get that, that the shape of the wing itself can be different on different birds. Okay. So I'm not just going to take it for granted that there's a generic hummingbird wing. I'm going to look at what is the shape of the wing that, that my bird has. All right, so I'm going to have a little curve across the front. This upper part here is covered with rows of feathers. And let's take a look at what those are. At the top of this wing, we're seeing a little kind of green patch. And next to that, there is a little, there's another little patch of feathers in here. So that is, here's my green patch, and then here's my extra little patch of feathers. And so notice what I did, by the way, in this, rather than drawing in a full feather here, I'm putting in a few, just a few little dots suggesting suggesting that there's sort of feathers and detail in here. I like to think of if there are feathers on something that are overlapping, imagine some overlapping feathers like that. Um, if I do, I'm putting a little dot, I will often be thinking of putting in those kind of at these points here. So if I'm drawing a little feather in there, there's a little, just a little kind of darkness. So that's what I'm thinking. Like there's another, see where I've got these dots. If I were to draw over this now, actually drawing in some, some uh, feathers. Um, I like, by the way, I like this effect that I'm getting here better than what I'm about to do, but I want to show you what I'm thinking about as I'm putting these little, so when I'm drawing that little dot here and that little dot there, what I'm envisioning in my head is that there's a feather here and there's a feather here and there's a feather here and there's a feather there. So I think it's better to suggest it rather than draw it all in. So instead, I can have, you know, just a little dot here, little dot there. So that little dot is, I'm suggesting that there's a little kind of point there where two of these feathers come together. Again, a suggestion of feathery scales is often better than um, putting in all, all the detail. Oh, this is kind of fun. Looking at this photograph here, and notice that here on the side, I am seeing the front view of scales in here. And as you get towards the back, it's harder to see those. You're looking at sort of side view of them. So that's sort of what I was talking about out here. It's kind of neat. So these feathers at the top right here, these are the lesser and median coverts. These ones right here, this little pad on the back, are the scapular feathers, the shoulder blade feathers 
of the hummingbird and they make their own little pad. And so those are up at the top of the wing. Then there is a row of these sort of bronzy ones in here. Um, these feathers are the greater secondary coverts. And then if you look down below, I see one, two, three feathers getting progressively long, and then a stack of feathers that are all about the same length. Those are the secondary feathers. The one, two, three are the tertials, and those are the secondary. So if you're new to kind of feather anatomy, don't worry about having to learn it all in this workshop. We're gonna, you're gonna be, uh, if you stick around with us, you're gonna be seeing, uh, encountering these terms and these sort of, uh, the topography of feathers in, in lots of different ways. But um, the result is that on the wing here, It's hard to see the actual feather edges up in here. Um, I'm gonna give you a row of, here are my greater coverts. Then the secondaries are going to be one, two, three, one, two, three feathers coming down, and then a whole pile that's the same length. And everything else that sticks out behind that are primary feathers. I'm gonna just hit my eraser through here so we can have a kind of a cleaner wing. My primary feathers are gonna stick through there. And um, let's see how many feathers I'm seeing in here. It looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You don't have to have the exact number of feathers unless you're doing a really careful illustration. What I usually do is I draw in the back edges of these feathers, two, three, four, five, keep it wider, six, seven, eight, nine, right? So I just draw in those back edges of those feathers first. And those line up, draw a line aiming up here. There's my little bird wing sticking up on top of that. Oops, there we go. Oh, nope, that way. Ah. Now, um, on this bird, I'm going to give it some undertail coverts, a little bit of fluffiness here. Very often, these feathers are a little bit more fluffy. Here's some undertail coverts. And um, the tail feathers on this species are ridiculously long. Um, in the males. This oh, I just wanted to draw that long tailed one so much that I had to throw it in. <clears throat> but the uh, on your hummingbird species, something that you'd really do want to look through for is what is the the how does the the wing length relate to its tail length? Here I've drawn this way tail way sticking out, but. On the hummingbird that you're looking at, are they the same? Are the tail feathers slightly longer? Are they a lot longer? So those that 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 comparison at the back there is very, very useful. So are they are they are they short? Are they longer? So I'm just going to put up David Sibley again, and you can look at the tips of his. So here on the green-breasted mango, um, you're seeing that these are were about at the same place. But on the green-violet ear here, the tail is slightly longer than those wingtips. So you want to look at on the 
the hummingbird that you are looking at. Look at this fairly long wings here on the Anna, on the calliope and on this broad tailed shorter wings relative to that tail. So where do those points line up on your bird? As a birder, that's a really good thing for you to look for. And also as an artist, it's gonna help us to pay attention to those spots as well. Um, on the, the tail here, we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I can see, uh, looks like eight feathers in there. Um, and on a shorter tailed one, just sort of imagine all of these, um, instead of being, you know, crazy long, all of these feathers close to the same length. Um, but then you would have ones in the middle that would be covering up most of the other ones out on the edges. Oh, beautiful, beautiful bird. This is the uh, hummingbird species that uh, we get uh, in my backyard here, this is the Anna's. Um, if you uh, look really carefully at the front of it, right up here, um, what you can see in uh, up here, there's a little bit of some primary coverts that are down here, very subtle in the front of this wing, but on most birds, um, that's that's really, really hard to see unless you're, say, drawing from a photograph. But I wanted to use this bird as um, also a study in kind of looking at the scaling patterns and also to get us starting to think about iridescence. Um, so here, this row that is coming towards you, you can see a row of feathers. But notice that that row is gets jumbled up it's coming down as they're in here on the head in, in this zone, you're seeing some straight rows of feathers. You're seeing straight rows of feathers coming down through this zone here. But out here, instead of coming down as an overlapping one row, they're fish scaling out so that they're now down in here, they're more in diagonal rows. So partway down the face of the hummingbird, there will be a change in the angles of these. So if I put that on this bird here, um, if I had feathers that were coming down nice, neat rows here, as we get out in here, if this gorget expands on the chest, instead of having these rows come down in this zone, you're going to get things that are overlapping more like fish scales. So, um, I sometimes have seen this drawn as just sort of coming down. People will see this symmetry and think that it must continue down here. It, 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 it doesn't. Let's think about the iridescence itself and how do we go about drawing this. So notice that here you're seeing some oranges and you're seeing some rose colors, um, some yellow greens, um, all these kind of colors bouncing back. There's also an area in here that is more grayed out. And this is where we want to start thinking about the irid what the iridescence is and does. Also notice like there's some nice rows in here. And then as the further you kind of get out from the throat, things just start to kind of get into this more and more random sort of scaly thing. But right in here, coming down in some straight rows, and then things are 
uh, playing out. But this big bright thing is how we see hummingbirds when the sun is behind you and the gorget is pointed towards you. And so people will get this flash of color and then they will draw that onto their hummingbird. Oh, actually, let's do a little, since we're here, let's just do a little three quarter view hummingbird head here. Um, so a little ball with a line coming down the middle of it, that gives you your center line. Which way is this hummingbird looking? It's gonna be, its beak is gonna be kind of coming out this way. So first of all, look at how short I'm gonna make this hummingbird's beak. Oh my goodness. It is so hard to draw a hummingbird beak foreshortened because we know it's got this outrageously long beak and but we don't so we we want to draw it longer than we would see it but if you're doing a, a bird with a, a at a foreshortened angle you're not going to be seeing that so here's the top of my bird's head and my eye is going to be back here for this eye shape I'm going to have curve on the back and then get it angry birds towards the front. I give it that kind of <clears throat> wild eye look. Here's my little triangle in front of my eye and my gorget here. If here's the center line of my gorget, my gorget is coming out, wrapping around the far side. It's coming out here, doing this. Wow, this gorgeous even flipping way out over here, isn't it? But you wanna kind of, in your head, be aware of where the center line of that gorget is, the center line of the head going back. And it is so hard. So what's going to make this is having your beak be short, your eye be angry, and then you want to sort of wrap your gorget around the front of that. But this, this one, the photographer has positioned himself. This is uh, Vivek Kenzode. Um, a photographer has positioned himself uh, with the sun at his back, and then the hummingbird looks towards him, and pow, you get this color. But if the bird turns its head a little bit, same bird turns its head a little bit, look at what happens. So what you've done is you've taken the hyper-reflective surface, and you've, you're now pointing it in a different direction, and we're starting to get this big dark shadow right in here. So head turned just a little bit. By the way, uh, folks at home, at this point, I'll bet Ray Bonto is sketching a new drawing of this little head from this angle, getting different proportions of the bill, different slightly eye shape, where the, the center line of the head is, and just sort of noticing like, okay, this is different, I can get this. So you might wanna be doing the same thing at home. Um, and, but, but notice that as the head turns here, we are now getting this shadow in here. So, um, a little head, longer bill, center line, um, we're going to come up, give my bird a flat top. And still kind of an angry bird's look in the front, right? But here's our wrote wow. 
and the center line of that throat goes down here. Center line over the top of that head is up in there somewhere. Um, but here's here's the actually this is going to come up even higher. But in here, I am getting this shadow. That's the important thing I want to note. I want to note this shadow zone now forming in here. Interesting, interesting. And we're going to compare that with what we get in just a moment um, as, as bird turns its head even more. Um, what's happening with the color? Color is going from red in here to orange in here to orange, yellow orange up here to greenish, yellow green down here. And so when you are looking at something with iridescence, I recommend that people very lightly, uh, let's just kind of go back to the previous bird, right? Um, I would very lightly map, do a color map. Um, and I'm gonna just put yellow green here. Um, and um, I'm going to have a zone in here that is red. Um, in here, orange, and off on the side, um, uh, red with yellow highlights. So then when you um, are putting in your color, you kind of know what colors to put there. The iridescent colors are going to change as this bird moves its head around. So deliberately map those colors in. Let's turn this bird's head even more. All right, um, now this one is not in as strong light, but it's also at a three quarter view here. Notice how dull these colors are getting. It's not nearly as vibrant as it was earlier. That's because we are at a three-quarter view with also a little bit more overcast, so not as intense light, um, but we're also getting this three-quarter view. As my bird head turns even more, look at that. It looks like somebody painted this bird wrong, but that bird is actually the same bird that we've been seeing Back here, look at the branch, same bird. Wow, whoo, all right. Now, still an angry bird. Um, oh, oh, here's, here's an important uh, hummingbird detail. If you see a white triangle behind the eye, put that in your sketch. So that's, that ends up being something that some birds, some hummers have, some don't. As, as, as sketchers, we wanna, we wanna look for that. But look at how, all the color has gone out here, except for a little bit on the sides. But what people tend to do is to draw it and paint it as, um, as being this big bright red thing, even from the side. Turn that head even more. Wow, where did all the color go? It's the angle and the lighting conditions. So now the sun is not directly behind you. You can tell that the sun is not directly behind you because um, of this shadow here. So the sun is more shining on this side back here where you can see a little bit of these iridescent colors coming out. But this big dark throat is also turning into the shadow and you don't get it. So now, even if you have a bright, so this, this hummingbird has a bright red throat, but you're just not seeing it from that angle. So I'm gonna suggest that people draw what you actually see. Draw what you actually see. Let's just make a quick sketch of this one on our paper, just to kind of keep ourselves in the, the hummingbird sketching game. Little hummingbird back. I'm going to give it a head, and this one is looking out fairly straight. 
a little bit of curve going down to a bump on the tummy. What about your forehead angle? We're kind of a swoop up there. And give it another ball. This one's tail is sticking out in this direction. Little under tail coverts here. And I'm gonna bring this tummy down more. And so its little feet can be up on top of this. The belly feathers have fluffed up over most of the wing. And the scapular feathers on the back have come down obscuring most of the wing. But we have a little bit of a short wing that is shorter than the tail sticking out here. What am I going to do on this head? I've got an eye back here. And I'm going to put a little triangle in. Like a little seam that kind of goes from the then there to the corner of the mouth. Think how tempting it would be to, on the belly of this bird, I mean, on the, the gorget of that bird, um, paint it bright. You're also seeing down here, I'm going to note there's a little, this, the, note this sort of white tuft that is down in here on this bird. Those are called the vent feathers. Sometimes you'll see pale vent feathers sticking out on your hummers. That's a good thing to look for um, on a lot of Hummers. Um, you can get kind of a light spot right around the vent. Draw the colors that you see. The more that you look carefully at, at birds, the more you're going to see. Um, if you do get a chance to kind of investigate one up close, I really recommend uh, doing that. In light, in, in uh, lieu of that, um, you can also do wonderful stuff training yourself from, from photographs. Let's just drop some watercolor in on some of these and watch what happens. If I want to make this look iridescent, I'm going to try to get two things. One is that, by the way, if I draw this, this one will look probably fairly cartoony, um, just because it is so brilliant all the way across. Um, but maybe I start with this. Can't hurt. I'm going to start with my lighter values. So I'm going to get some yellow paint tested off on the side. I'm going to put some yellow paint in on the sides here. I'm going to give it a little bit of green down in here. I'm going to give it some orange across here and shade that into red. I'm going to kind of flick this out a little bit to kind of get a little bit more kind of irregular pattern into here.
and then stop. Um, this looks a little bit, you know, less iridescent because the angle that I'm come getting in here, not very, not very exciting. It doesn't have those darks. But when you you'll find that when you are able to kind of actually put these darks in like this, that the iridescent things are going to. So this isn't a problem for us. This is an, a this is a, a this is a feature, not a bug. Um, when you get a little bit of dark, it'll improve the look of your iridescence. So we're going to try that here on this gorget. And I'm going to start with a little bit of orange and a little bit of yellow. Um, and put that on and bring it across. So some, I've got some yellow on the throat of my bird. On the other side, I'm going to get some red, actually mix some magenta into that. And I want some orange happening between them. And in this, uh, so I get this sort of base coat. Oh, I want to get a little glob of green. So I've got a base coat of these colors here. And notice that this doesn't look iridescent yet. So I'm about to put some dark, the dark shadow zone on top of this, and it will make this look a lot better. It'll make it look better than this one, um, which, you know, this again, just sort of feels more like, eh, I can't really tell your dimension here. So I'm gonna get a little bit of dark color here. I'm gonna use um, some, uh, bloodstone genuine. Where's my bloodstone genuine? My bloodstone genuine is right here. So bloodstone genuine is a dark brown color, sort of a warm reddish brown, and um, that's one of my favorite Daniel Smithy colors. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do is now come in here, and I am going to draw in. Uh, a little bit of reflection off the wet paint here. Um, so start to be a little bit easier to see as that paint dries. I'm putting in some of these little feather edges. And what do I want to do off on the side here? Maybe a few little just dots. There. And I'm going to let that. I'm going to let that dry, and it is going to sort of help me be a. Um, my uh, ref sort of dark value zone in my paint. So I need a little bit more paint in here. Okay. The last thing that I'm going to do uh, while that's drying, 
and we'll come back and take a look at that in a, in a second, is just add some, um, add some, uh, some, I'm, I'm gonna give you a green bodied hummingbird. Um, and what I'm gonna do is just make a little sketch off on the side here of one more little kind of hummingbird body. We're gonna put it at a three quarter angle and um, I am going to um, then show you one more little trick for kind of making it look all glowy and iridescent. -y. Um, let me... So, I um, see on, on this one, I'm actually going to make this one at a pretty steep angle because it's going to be turned towards me a little bit. Um, so, it's uh, Bill's going to be foreshortened. It's going to be a branch that comes across here. Um, I'm making this birdie up out of, I'm not looking at a, a reference picture for this. Um, so there isn't a reference for this, but this is just sort of a kind of a quick little hummer. This bird's zipper is right here. That's the center line of its tummy. And Feeling a little bit angry birds. And I am going to, what I want to do is to, um, to, to make this bird, uh, there's, there are many hummers that are, have a lot of green on them. I want this to be one of those. I'm gonna give this one some white down here by its vent. Oh, I never got into the flying birds, which is my, I actually have some material on that. First, I wanted to show you this, because <clears throat> this is, this is a great little, um, I'm a, a, a hummingbird, and um, I am, uh, All right, let's make this a, 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 a female hummingbird. And so on the throat here, there's just gonna be a number of little streaks going up in that pattern, little kind of dotty streaks. Uh, she's gonna have a little white triangle behind the eye. Um, And then her wing is going to be mostly out of view here. Make a little bit longer. You can even have, here's part of the other wing from the other side sticking out. Got a little birdie feet. And I'm gonna give her a little bit of a white bib Notice how that bib comes down, hits the center line, and then curves back up here. And then that's going to give her, um, we're going to give her just a, 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 a blush of, of, of green on either side of that. Uh, let's see here. So I'm going to give her some greenish feathers down in here. Um, and I'm just going to put some hatching lines with fairly broad uh, spacing in them that both kind of helps that feel like a rounded form, but 
if you then see any of the edges of those, then it kind of feels like, oh, there's sort of larger belly feathers wrapping around the belly here. Um, now, um, she's going to be a, a hummer with a lot of dark on her. I'm gonna make this um, a very, I've got my, my paint here on the back. I'm gonna use some lighter green. Maybe some lighter green in here. I wonder what species of this. This is a hummingbird species I'm making up. Um, and the green on her is going to go into an even darker green, um, where it's not the, the, there's maybe more light catching on the back. Um, but the, the, the greens can also go really, really dark when, not in the light. My brush strokes kind of wrap around the tummy here. Now I'm getting even darker with that paralene green. But what I want is just to have a little hint that there is some iridescent light shimmering on it. So what I'm going to do is this is gouache paint. And I'm going to grab some light value gouache here. And this will be most effective when if I let this dry. And I can give her just a few feathers in here that are catching the light. Let's zoom down on her. This yellow green gouache, put a little bit in here, put a little bit just sort of on some of these feathers that would be catching that light. And that can um, just sort of give you a sense that in that, that place where you're going from dark to light, that there are some that are really kind of catching brighter light on the edge. That can be an effective hummingbirdy moment. So that's what I am, let's see, I think I've got some sketch. Yeah, here's some. So here, just in this little sketch here, I put dark, I put green, and then I put some gouache dit, 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 right in there on that edge, and that catches that light. Um, there's any other hummers that have a similar treatment? Well, here is, yep, here is, um, here is doing that with the gouache, but with purple as well as green. So I've just kind of come put in a dark shadow. And then, and you see right along here, kind of coming along with some of that gouache on the, the bright side. And that gives you just a little bit of, of shimmery in there. My final thought is what about hummingbirds that are flying? Well, I'm glad you asked.
Um, so when hummingbirds are flying, their wings are beating so fast, you cannot see them. And so with photography, we can catch those wings and we stop the blur. But we're not going to be able to do that with, um, with real hummingbirds in flight. So um, what I recommend is not thinking that you're supposed to somehow be a camera that can stop things in motion. Because if you draw the hummingbird like this, you're drawing a picture of a photograph. You're not drawing what you see. Um, but notice the positions of, you know, the, the, the wings are going to blur from back here in a point to up here in a uh, sort of a, a dollar point back and forth. But it's going to be a blur back and forth when they're hovering across that. What you will see as a kind of clear thing is the um, almost magically levitating body of the hummingbird. And so look at the negative shape behind that. And when you're drawing the hummingbird in flight, is it doing this? Is it doing this? What is the, the shape that you see along the back of that hummingbird? Um, here, give this one a little head. Give it a throat that comes down, body. And here's your undertail coverts and your tail fanning around. But you'll have this little body that is just floating in the air there. And there will be a blur of wings across it. One way of handling that is to first draw in your bird. And then look at the angle that those wings are going across it and put in some, a blur of lines across that. That's really all you'll see of those wings. So don't feel you're supposed to somehow get this thing that you cannot see. Um, it looks cool if you have a, um, I don't have my paper blender with me. Um, so what I'm going to do is quickly reach over, grab into the recycling here. I'm going to take a little piece of paper and I'm going to twist it up. And there's a great hummingbird wing blur. So on that other one, you know, here's its head, and it's kind of going to come out a little bit to a tummy and then down to a straight. So okay. So what is what are you doing? Here's my little wing blur. So that you actually are then drawing something that's a lot closer to what you see. But notice how you will be able to kind of capture the posture, the, the, the position of that bird in flight. So here, what you also will notice is the tail will flick from being out to down very, very rapidly. So uh, you can draw, do one of those drawings where you have a, you know, one tail, one body, two tail positions. You can, you can track those. Here's a little hummer. And this one's wings are probably beating across it like that. So I'll make the lines in the direction that 
um, that those wings are beating back and forth. And then you can draw the details of the hummingbird really, really crisply. And that contrasted with that blur of the wings gives you a neat effect. And that's my thoughts on bird and flight. Oh, one last thing. This was, uh, uh, my daughter wanted me to include this bird. Uh, we saw these in uh, Ecuador and uh, they have the vent feathers really, really kind of poofed out on these ones. Um, so they um, looked like my daughters decided that they were wearing Ugg boots. And so we refer to these birds, uh, the booted racket tails as Uggs uh, in our family. So there's, there's, there's Uggs. I just wanted to uh, let you folks uh, appreciate um, Uggs. Um, Uggs the hummingbird. I, so that's a smorgasbord of uh, strategies that you can use. And I hope that that makes the idea of drawing hummingbirds uh, a lot more fun and accessible. So you don't have to have, you don't have to, you know, capture like, like what is going on with this. We can't see it. Draw my hand. Who knows? Um, let's jump over to uh, our discussion group here. Um, I know I've already kind of gone um, uh, over our, 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 <laughs> our time. <laughs> Um, but I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't stop myself. Um, but if anybody has any uh, specific questions about drawing hummingbirds or iridescence, um, I want to encourage you to raise your hand, um, and uh, let's, uh, join Kate and see what you are thinking. Um, I'm going to add you into the spotlight and I'll allow you to, uh, you there. Hey there, good to see you. Hey, um, I actually had questions about iridescence in relation to ducks and other waterfowl. Um, I've been doing a lot of drawings of like the golden eyes and stuff oh, that's starting to migrate up in Washington right now. And figuring out how to do something that's like very glossy black that has a sheen to it is really difficult. So I'm trying to figure out how to layer that. And this isn't so, on my so good- Let's take a look at that again. I don't know if I tried it on this one, but I've got more ducks, so. Yeah, so you're, you're now getting into your duck zone so that you've, you've filled up a sketchbook with coyotes and now you're getting- Well, I didn't fill up that. It's the same sketchbook. It's not full yet. Uh, we've just been seeing a lot of ducks, so I figured- Oh, nice head. I want to work on getting the shape. Also, I learned about the duck stamp competition. Yeah. Um, I didn't know there were such intense rivalries in that. Um, oh, oh, man. The, I, I think that um, it, it, it probably rivals uh, a, a dog show uh, people, just sort of the intensity that, that people kind of uh, uh, bring to it. And there are very, very strong um, opinions about what is proper duck stamp style. I was a judge yeah. for a while for, for, the, as the, for the, in California, we have the junior duck stamp competition. And there were these um, really interesting discussions and people come to it with very strong opinions. Oh, fun. Oh, what yeah. lovely golden eye you're having. But I want to try and bring through some of that iridescence and doing that on black has been really hard because yes. I'll put like a base layer down with that color and then 
I'll try and lift it away a little bit, or these ones, I may try and mix it in while it's still wet, which doesn't really work very well. Sometimes like if you do thing where it's wet on wet and then you do like a drop so it pushes away the other pigment. Yeah. Um, then you get those sort of weird spidery patterns that get around. Yeah, it doesn't quite stuff. work. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to do that. Do you have any advice on how yeah, to bring let, out let, like- Let's do that right now. Um, so just to kind of add to this sort of discussion of iridescence, um, let's take a look at let's say you have a duck um so the duck bill comes down goes to the bottom of the head there's a little bit of duck throat let me give this duck head Ducks have a big cheek. The eye sits up rather high on it. Um, now I'm going to um, go over this. Get a little bit lower on the duck here. Can you see that okay, Kate? Yeah, I can. All right, so um, here is. Duck smile. So on my little duck friend here, um, there's a big cheek that is sticking out here. So that means that this zone here will tend to be in the dark a little bit more. The cheek sticks out here. This area will tend to catch light a little bit more. And then in here, uh, probably, you know, I want that to be darker to contrast it. This surface here might be catching the light more because it's sort of pointing up. And then we'll kind of be getting into here, we'll be in more in the shade. So I'm kind of mapping out, sort of thinking where my duck is going to be light, where my duck is going to be dark. And sort of maybe medium in here. So I want sort of some light in here, maybe some light in here, maybe some light going down the side of the neck. And I want that to feel all sheeny. Um, let's take a look at the duck you're, you're checking out and the colors, um, iridescent colors usually blend into each other. So on this one, I'm going to make it mostly green iridescence, but shading into a little bit of blue. And so I'm going to get some green paint here. And I will sometimes put the, that on first. And then I'm going to put the, oh, we wanted, I forgot, I wanted that shading into a little blue. I'm going to get a little bit of blue here, put some uh, blue around the edges of that. What blue are you using? Um, that's some phthalo blue. It's a very strong staining blue. But uh, um, I know that this is going to, well, this whole business will be getting darker later on. And um, so it will, uh, I, I, I didn't want it to be overwhelmed. I wanted it to kind of come through a little bit. So that's some phthalo blue. That was Hooker's green, the green that I had on there. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take some dark and I can either use, um, I've got neutral tint. I've also got Payne's gray. They're both very good darks. Payne's gray is what I might use today because it's got a slight blue cast to it. And I'm going to mix that up.
and I'm going to put that on here. That part of that is this duck is still wet. And so I'm getting some nice kind of soft edges. Other places I'm getting harder edges, but I'll kind of come in and mess with that in a little bit. Off the top of that, right? Right now, this just looks, you know, this these edges look really, really harsh, don't they? But give it a moment. <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is I'm going to clean my brush off. And I'm just going to come in here and drag my brush along the edge of that dark. Drag the brush along the edge of the dark there. Oh, I want to bring more dark into the forehead here. And that sort of softened that. Trying to do that without lifting out too much paint. <laughs> I'm getting myself a clean brush. I'm having a hard, as I'm trying to, I'm trying to just soften this edge in here. But I keep on lifting out way too much paint. Now I'm getting a lot of more sort of intense, thick, dark in my brush. Coming into these zones and making my darks really go dark. I'm going to grab a little bit of dark green. Uh, this is, I've now got perylene green on my brush and just see if I can kind of kick this back a little bit. Going to bring in a little bit of perylene green on this edge here. And soften it. Now I'm going to do one last thing. Um, you can only do when it sits dry. So I'm going to kind of cheat here by using a hair dryer to dry my little duck head.
I'm going to use a little bit of colored pencil on top of this. And um, colored pencil um, doesn't work well on paper that's damp, but it works great once you dry, dry it out a little bit. So going across the room, grabbing my dinner colored pencil. I keep a small set of colored pencils in my nature journal kit. And what I'm going to do is get a fairly light colored pencil here. There's a little light green colored pencil. <laughs> And I can put in sort of the suggestion of uh, let's drop down on that a little bit more. Uh, we're actually, we're not really able to see any of these pencil marks on the camera, I'm afraid. Um, we can see a little. A little bit of blue has a reflected light on the underside of the head there. Maybe. That's kind of fun. Just kind of give you this sort of hint of iridescence, slightly changing tone. Oh, Jack, um, we have a question about whether the pencil that you're using, is it a regular colored pencil or is it a watercolor pencil? Um, here I'm using, this is a regular colored pencil. Um, this one is a watercolor pencil, but I'm not using it like a watercolor pencil. It was just was the most handy one that I could grab. But this one with angles on it here is a watercolor pencil, this one here. But um, I usually use... Uh, I was just looking for that color, so that's why I grabbed that watercolor pencil. I wasn't grabbing it because it was a watercolor pencil. But these, these ones here are regular colored pencils, which you can use with, um, you can use those with, uh, um, on top of watercolor very, very easily. Kate, was this useful? Oh, I have to allow you to unmute. Um, so you can unmute now, Kate. Yeah, that was extremely useful, um, especially seeing how much pigment you put down, because I feel like I'm always a little bit hesitant to put down pigment, because um, I'll try and put in a much lighter value at first and watching you really just glom it on there. Um, and what that does to create that really rich, vibrant color. Um, that was really cool. I'm start doing that. Yeah, yeah. Get, play, play with that and see what where that takes you. Um, and then you can think of these 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 spaces as things that you can then kind of carve into. Yeah, and especially looking at how you mapped out everything. 
Um, is this done on watercolor paper or? Um, um, this is a big pad of, uh, what is this? This is Strathmore drawing paper. Mm. So it's not, you know, it buckles a little bit, but, uh, but uh, yeah. Oh, this is, I think I like this better, kind of getting, bringing some black into this neck a little bit more to separate those little zones. It's fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah feel feel uh, free to 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 push, to push the um, what the um, with with your values. Go go big on it, and then you because you can also. You know, let's say I don't like the position of some of these darks here. If you have a, 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 a heavier paper, you actually can check this out. So let's say I, I, I covered up a lot. I like this better here, having a bunch of this covered up. But let's say I wanted to undo that. Um, I, I can, look at this. There it is coming back. That green stained the paper more than the um, than the the black, so I can actually lift out some of that black. So I want more, say, green through here. It's fun. You can sort of push and pull it. Yeah, that's remarkable. Yeah. The, I think that, yeah, having some of those intense darks next to the shimmering, changing colors really uh, makes a big difference. Um, well, let me see here. Bouncing over to the gallery. Are there any other kind of questions relating to this area of things hummingbird related uh, or iridescence related? All right, not seeing any. Are there, is there anybody that would like to share stuff that is happening in your journal. Jack, good to have you with us. Um, I'm gonna bring you on spotlight here and just a moment, you'll be able to, now you can unmute. Hey. Good to see you. So... Oh. Oh, fun. Uh, hold on, let me uh, minimize my screen so that we can make this bigger. Oh, some nice hummingbird shapes in here. Really nice hummingbird shapes. I like your humming, you've got the angle of the hummingbird forehead. That, that sort of, they've got a nice little slope that comes down. Um, I like how you've got that. Yeah, I feel like, um... I really like the technique of like drawing its back and then doing the um, the head circle and then the body. Um, lately, I've been doing like the, um, with the non photo glue pencil, um, doing like the circle and all the stuff with the non photo glue pencil, and then starting with pencil. I feel like uh, when you're outside sketching birds, it's like a little. It takes a little too long to like switch between pencils. Um, so I I really like doing the just starting with the back and then working everything with the pencil. That's, that's um, a very good strategy to do. Yeah, sometimes if if the tools are getting in your way and kind of slowing you down, 
right? You want to adapt and to um, find what works for you for um, for the the uh, I, I I sometimes I'm finding myself um, you know doing the the same thing where even if I'm drawing in, in ballpoint pen I'll lightly sketch with the ballpoint pen instead of reaching for my non photo blue pencil which is not my usual thing um, but uh, actually I think as a, a bunch of the the hummingbirds that we were looking at earlier. Um, had that going on. Just that there was so much hummingbird action in front of me, I felt like I don't even have time to switch pens going on here. I just need to uh, let's see if I can find an example of that. Um. Now I'm looking at through those sketches and I'm seeing lots of ones where I was not sketching with my blue pencil, I was sketching with a purple pencil. Uh, okay, oh, here's, 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 here's one. It's upside down, but <laughs> now that one was first just diving in with pen. That one was diving in with pen. Um, this one here, I dove in with a uh, light blue, uh, or light, light purple pencil. And, uh, Yeah, yeah. Some of these, this one started with, looks like it started with pen as well. That's Uggs with the Ugg boots. That's funny. And after Tuesday's um, class on lichen, yeah. I, at first I kept calling it lichen. Um, <laughs> And I found some on a rock and oh. I did that. Oh, nice. Nice little inset detail there. Good, it reminds me of, so you're really being conscientious about I noticed, I wonders, your, it reminds me of. And using that style of zooming in to, uh, to get the details there on that rock face. Love it. And after that, I just picked up this little berry and um, I was about to flick it, but I just started journaling it because it was pretty cool. And when I did the cross section, um, I'm wondering what it is because it was really small, like, yeah, five millimeters long. But when I, I have this little tool that um, you can like slice berries and blades of grass to get like a um, just perfect, nice, clean slice. After I did that, there was like, I thought that this um, original thing was a seed, but then inside here, was this hollow little thing that looked like a seed. So I'm not really sure what it is. Oh, that's really cool. What a, the case of the wrinkly seed. Oh, this is great. I, I mean, what a wonderful way to investigate things. How, through your own direct observations on things like that, how would you go about starting to come up with your own answers for your own questions on that? Well, um, so first I started out with just the sketch of the berry and then I, I put in, I usually, before I even start doing anything, I just put, um, I am, I notice, I wander and it reminds me of in each in little separate places on the paper. And I just kind of start with a couple of those and then I switch to a little more of the drawing and then finish the drawing. And then ask some questions, do some I notice. Um, it reminds me of. Um, and then since it was a berry, I took my little tool and cut it in half. And um, and now I'm wondering, is this really a berry and not a seed? It's actually a berry with a seed inside it. And I found it next to the gutter outside our house. So I'm wondering if it came from a tree um, and it kind of like maybe bounced down the um into the gutter when it rained and then got washed down and some bird picked it up and moved it a little um to the side i don't know but yeah well, as you're investigating around i want to encourage you to sort of have that seed that uh, that berry kind of on your radar and see if you might be able to um eventually discover the plant that that originated on, 
That would be a really yeah. fun thing to, to, to look for. It wouldn't and solve the case of the, the wrinkly fairy, but it would be another clue, uh, relevant clue in um, looking at that. It'd be then fun to slice open some of the other ones that are, like, can you find other ones that are still on the tree? Do they have the same thing inside? Wouldn't that be interesting? And two days ago, I started this little thing. Um, I called it the moon in a week. So I sketched the moon, um, then kind of did a little, little sky around it and a couple observations. Um, and then day two did the same thing. And in a week, I should have most of the phases. Oh, let me, um, I'm going to close out my window again. That's cool. Oh, oh, this is really fun. This is really fun. And you're also looking at other um, things that are going on. Like, you know, there's lots of birds chirping. Um, something that might be really interesting to do is to keep track of, to try to do it at the same time each day of the week. And to notice two things. One is, where is the moon at that same time at different locations along the horizon? So is it at the same time? Let's say, let's say you, you, you go out at, at 2 p.m. and you do your moon sketch. And it is vertically above that tree, right? It's above that tree. 2 p.m. the next day, is it above that tree, right? Or has it moved to a different place? Has it moved to the right or has it moved to the left? Also, you notice that you're, you're recording how the, the, the waxing moon is growing to keep track of, you know, is there a change in the angle, in the angle of that, that moon or is that the same? The, um, I'm thinking actually next month when the moon is a crescent, I'll, I'll have some stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll post some stuff to kind of uh, catch this, but I want us to do sort of another moon observation geek out. Um, and it'd be fun to have all of us at different latitudes and longitudes um, doing a moon investigation. But I think that your project is really interesting and it'd be fun to add to that, the idea of where is the moon in the sky at the same time each day. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because um, on day two, well, on both of the days, I think they were both in the sky, but sometimes um, it's in the sky most of the day, um, almost the entire day. And then sometimes it's already dark and we're watching the moon rise. Right, right. So what's up with that? What is up with that? And what phase is the moon in when you are seeing it all day during the day? What phase is the moon in when um, you, know, you see it coming up at night? And the moon can be sneaky, right? Because it, has, it can ha take the same like a crescent shape, but on one time it's waxing, getting bigger, on another time it's waning, getting smaller. So also kind of having on your, your radar, so waxing crescent moon. When am I seeing that? When does that rise? What about half moon? What about waxing gibbous moon? What about full moon? When does that rise? What about waning half moon? When does that rise? When does it set? Um, and um, as long as, if, if I remember right, when the moon ro rose in the evening when it was already dark, I only remember it being full. Ah, interesting, right? So let's, um, let's both of us really start paying attention to it. If we can track that over a month, I'll bet we would notice some really interesting things. That's cool, that's cool. So where it is on the horizon, What's below it? Um, 
what is the shape that is coming up, what time it is. All right. Um, so you're, you're starting your observation set. Now you're going to do moon in a week. Um, when our moon gets too full, um, should we um, both, it's now a little bit more than half, right? Um, so we've got waxing gibbous now, and so soon it'll, it'll be full. Um, why don't we, um, both once it starts uh, with the, the next full moon, why don't the two of us and anybody else who's watching who wants to kind of dig in on this, let's start tracking moonrise, moonset, um, all those shapes and sort of see what patterns uh, we can. I'm going to bounce over to my um, gallery view here. Um, just show of hands, anybody else in on this? All right, Avea, yep, Susan's going to be in on it. Um, we've got, a, 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 so, oh, yep, and Ray Bonto over in Europe, Rena. So a bunch of us are going to, well, let's start with the next full moon. Let's start a, a lunar month of geek out it, geeking out on that. And so at some point during that, there's going to be one day where I'm going to try to get a, a near when we've got a waxing crescent moon, where I'm going to try to get everybody to make a bunch of moon observations over the course of one day. But let's start this with the next, the next full moon. That sound good? All right. <laughs> All right, Jack. That's going to be cool. This is going to be fun. And I had, oh. yeah, and I had one more other thing. I was just um, this little guy here. Oh. Oh, whoa. This is, this is just this little sketch I did just from a um, field guide, but I had the need to draw on a hell. <laughs> oh, this is such an exciting drawing. So folks, notice several things that Jack's going on, got going on here. Um, first, I want people to notice the lost and found line. Along the back, the top of the owl, we're seeing that hard edge. And as you come around onto the underside, notice how he has softened that line and just sort of showing the contour on the shadow side with, the, the, with value, not with a hard edge. Also, Jack has avoided the temptation of like drawing in every feather, every detail, letting those whites really work um, to define a lot of this form. On the, the, the edge of the wing there, down towards the bottom, just a few of the, the, the dark spots in that, and we're getting a sense for the, the patterns in this owl. I also really like those eyes. Notice that there's a shadow across the eye and a highlight over that. And it, you really get a sense that those eyes have depth to them. Oh, that's really fun. Yeah, I, I use that trick where like with the non blue pencil, put a little like an eye a little bit bigger than the owl's eye, like right where the beak would be to correctly space out the eyes. Nice, very good. Uh, and that's it. Hey, uh, that's you, you had some really great stuff to, to, to show us. Thank you so much for doing that. And Thank you. Um, the, uh, um, I'm afraid that I'm going to have to, to, to leave early um, today. Um, I've got to, uh, I'm going to be teaching um, kids at my daughter's school about how to measure your pace. And uh, we're going to be doing a big biometrics thing. So I need to get over there. And um, <laughs> it says biometrics for the win. Um, so I need to get over there and set up our 100-meter uh, uh, walking course and, and have a bunch of other things out for people to start kind of getting their biometrics jam on. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, folks, if you haven't figured out your own pace, metrically. Um, I want to encourage you to do that. Um, 
just actually, uh, does anybody, uh, uh, if, if, if you, uh, just uh, by, by show of hands, would, 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 uh, does anybody want a review on, on how to kind of figure out your own pace and those sort of things or people down with that? A few folks? Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do that in a, in a future class, but it'll be fun. Um, before we go, actually, I see that um, Ray Bonto has jammed on a page of some cool stuff. So we're going to bounce over there, and then, but then I'm going to have to, to scoot out. Jack, thank you so much for sharing that stuff with us. That was really cool. Um, and Ray Bonto, I'm going to have to leave in just a moment, but I really wanted to see what you have been doing and what's going on in your journal. I'll be very quick. Um, oh, so. lovely. Nice angles, nice line weight. And I thought you might be sketching all those head positions. <laughs> well done, well done. And then, yeah, these are some crows and some little birds. By the way, I saw that wren after a year, after a year. Six months. Wrens are so much fun. And you look at that, that, that upright tail position. Uh, actually, hold us close to that. So folks, check out this little wren drawing. So three quarter view of the wren, you see the center line coming up the belly where the breast feathers come together. Um, head, body at three quarter view. That's why it's at such, such a steep angle, tail up looking very, very wrenny. Um, you know, there's a, so much going on on that, in that little study that really shows your um, understanding of bird form. And then this little bit. Um, Is there more courtship behavior at the uh, at the pigeon party? Less. Oh, less. Yeah, it's very strange. Mm, Tuesday, uh, most of the birds were chasing each other. Yeah. And today. Mm, there are only a few pairs out of thousands of pigeons. How strange. How strange. I wonder if time of day of the observation makes any impact. I wonder if weather makes any impact on that. Hmm. Huh. That's a really interesting observation. Yeah, I would expect as we get closer towards spring, What's, what's hap going to happen with the male birds is that during winter, their, their testes get smaller and smaller and smaller. They're not producing testosterone through their system. But then as spring comes in, those regrow inside their bodies. And so they get all this urge to do like, right? they start all their displaying and, you know, and just getting their game on. Um, the, uh, so I wonder, I wonder why we would see that. Is it the same kind of weather? Or are you like in a cold spell right now? Or is it is the weather roughly equivalent to what you remember it being with the previous set of observations? It is, the weather is the same. There was a little less wind. The, I observed that the wind actually scares the pigeons away. Okay. So that that won't that doesn't help really. Yeah. Um, oh. It's been it's same partly sunny, partly cloudy, and there's only a one hour time difference since the last set. Well, I arrived one hour earlier than the last day. At what time of day was it? Around today, it was two, no, two thirty. So before it was around three thirty. 
Okay, because and that does put it sort of in the middle Three. of the day. Last two, I think, was I don't really remember to tell the truth, but maybe it was one. It's either one hour before or one hour after last day. Huh. Because um, I'm thinking that, you know, I wonder if, like, if it's close to bird bedtime, a lot, and a lot of birds will sing more right before they go to bed. So I could see maybe doing more displays and having an uptick in those sort of behaviors. But if it's in the middle of the day, yeah, not so much. That's, that's, that's a cool little mystery. So Jack's got a mystery and you've got a mystery. Um, I want to encourage you to start tracking. Um, start tracking the amount of courtship behavior that you see in those uh, pigeons. And that... And then thinking about how does that, uh, what are what other variables might be going on? So, so being conscious of weather, being conscious of time, being conscious of, you know, there's probably some interesting related variables that we're not even thinking of right now. That's fun. I also remember last day somebody was giving food. Um, that might have attracted more. Oh. But last I recorded 70 to 80 pigeons. Yeah. Um, today, I tried counting with the amount that came. First, they came one by one, so it was easy to count. Mm -hmm. And then one went away to spread the news that I was here. And then a huge, flock, <laughs> countless flock came in. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, let's also you know work up when you can't do a direct count, you can try work on estimating where you kind of go one to three, you know, 10, yeah, kind of group count them like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. That's 50. And it's about 50 pigeons. That's what 50 pigeons like. So that's 50, that's hundred pigeons, that's 150, that's about 200 pigeons. Right. So when you can't go like one, two, no, you moved. Okay, one, two, no, that moved again. Okay, one, no, hold still. Oh no, okay, this isn't working. Yeah. You can get it to, you can kind of group count like that. That's cool. Uh, yeah, let's, let's see what happens when you start um, tracking some of those variables and see um, if any patterns emerge. I'd be really interested in what you discover. Yeah, thank you. Hey, it's really good to see you. Good to see you too. Be well and be well, everyone. Let's take care of each other, we want to take care of ourselves, our communities, and this planet. Um, right now, all of us are in the, you know, this, this, this pandemic has been so harsh on so many people, especially in communities that don't have access to the same kind of health care that I enjoy here in the United States. Um, I know Margarita in your community um, has been uh, it, just it, hammered by this thing. And I hope that you are well and that our, um, that, uh, let's, let's keep looking out for each other. And remember that one thing we have to do since the virus doesn't respect political boundaries, as we are thinking about our response to it, we have to start sort of thinking like a virus. Um, so we have to start thinking about, you know, that, that the lines on a map don't really matter in terms of our response to this. We need to be working as a world community to address this together. And, um, and be well, everyone. Uh, do what you can to protect yourself and others. And I will look forward to, to seeing you all again soon. Margaret, it is really fun to see you again. I, you all take care.